Hello, and welcome to Animated Reviews. I'm Dan CBJ, and today we are reviewing the reproducibility crisis in science. Now, there are already a bunch of great videos summarizing the reproducibility crisis, which burst onto the science scene around 2014 with an explosion of media attention. I'm going to put links in the description if you want to learn more about what it is and get some ideas about what people are saying about it. But the general idea is that across multiple disciplines in social and life sciences, an unsettlingly high proportion of results from published peer-reviewed studies appear to be difficult or impossible to replicate, bringing into question the whole foundation of our scientific knowledge in these fields. Well here, the goal is to give you a glimpse of the data and the papers behind this problem that all these videos, articles, and media outlets have been talking about, and then break it down to show you the information that lies beneath the final figures, and discuss how the researchers got it. If you have any questions or feedback for me throughout the video, please let me know in the comments and I'll be sure to get back to you. I'm going to break down this meta review, which in fact reviews several reviews on the reproducibility of preclinical research, biology and related research that has some kind of application for future medicine, but doesn't involve actual human patients. This study was published in 2015, and it's one of many influential and striking papers that really tried to point out the extent of the reproducibility problem, its impact, and how to solve it. The authors focus on potential reasons for the reproducibility problem, and what it might mean in terms of the money wasted on non-reproducible results. They start with a simple summary of studies that have, in various ways, attempted to define the amount of irreproducibility preclinical research. Each bar shows the percentage of non-reproducible studies out of the total number of studies investigated within each review. As you can see, they vary quite a bit, from 51 to 89%. But even at the lowest estimate, does that mean that the results for more than half of all medical-related biological studies are actually false? Well, that depends on what it is about these studies that actually causes this inability to replicate the results. Because non-reproducibility can mean anything from the results are false to I'm not sure how they performed that experiment, the authors came up with four broad and in some cases overlapping categories which could act as the potential sources for flaws or errors in reproducibility. They are study design, things like not having enough samples for proper statistical testing, not repeating experiments, using inappropriate statistical methods, or failing to have proper controls. The second category is biological reagents and reference materials. This is where things like contamination, mislabeling, and handling mistakes come into play for either the biological samples or the reagents and tools that the researchers are using. The third category is laboratory protocols, the issues that come up during the prep or execution of the experiments. Now, in this case, there weren't any studies available that directly assess these kinds of errors in preclinical settings. So the authors had to extrapolate from two studies that assessed errors in the preparation and testing of biological samples from human patients, or in other words, clinical, not preclinical studies. This included things like wrong identification of patients, inappropriate specimen quantity or quality, and some communication issues. And for the final category, data analysis and reporting, this refers to whether or not the authors of a given study have included enough of the relevant details in their methods for others to repeat what they've done. It also includes actual errors in the analysis, like accidentally screwing up, screwing up a calculation without realizing, which is thankfully a lot more rare, as far as we know. So having set up the four different categories from which irreproducibility could arise, it's time to see how much each one really affects it. Basically, the researchers went through several review studies that assessed the prevalence of errors in each category, and selected one or two that they felt best fit the specific category to find the lowest and highest estimates of errors reported so far. I'll tell you what the source data was for each of these numbers, and you can decide if you think they're a good fit for the category or not. For study design, the authors used two studies that evaluated statistical testing methods. More specifically, both studies were investigating the use or misuse of p-values. They got their low estimate from a 2014 analysis of more than 75,000 medical papers, and estimated a false discovery rate of 14%. For the high estimate, they cited a mathematical study which calculated the likelihood of reporting false results as being up to 25% if researchers used a cutoff rate for statistical significance of 0.05. 
which is, and has long been, the standard in biology. For biological reagents and reference materials, they used a 2007 review on cell line contamination or misidentification as their representative for the category. 14.9-36% to of cell lines assessed were either contaminated or falsely identified, though I should point out that this is only including US data and that the cell lines assessed were not necessarily used in published papers. For lab protocols, they took the low and high estimates of error from a 2007 clinical study, which was just 0.3-0.5%, to 0.5%, but then multiplied by 19 in an attempt to account for the difference between clinical and preclinical studies. This number comes from another study that found that papers from lab settings had a tendency to overinterpret the clinical applicability of their findings nearly 19 times more often than papers from clinical settings. Lastly, for data analysis and reporting, the authors mentioned that one major study on preclinical research had found inadequate reporting in as many as 41% of the papers assessed, while others had misreporting rates as high as 87%. However, they decided to go with the data from a study of clinical trials performed in 2002 on the adequacy and reporting of something called allocation concealment, a technique used specifically in clinical trials to ensure that no one in the study, patients or study personnel, could figure out which patients were assigned to which treatment group. Now, This study found that 18% of the clinical trials from that year had failed to do this appropriately, while 26% were unclear. So the authors here chose 18% as their conservative, lower-end estimate for the errors in reproducibility associated with data analysis and reporting in preclinical research. They also took this number for their high estimate. So when you combine the error rates from the four different categories together, what is the overall rate of irreproducibility? Well, the authors wanted to account for the very clear possibility of overlap between the categories, so they took the highest of the low estimates, 18%, and said, that's the lowest it can be, even if all four different categories completely overlap. For the highest possible irreproducibility rate, assuming absolute minimal overlap, they simply took the sum of all the high estimates, 88.5%. For a modest estimate of the combined irreproducibility rate, the midpoint between the two would be 53.3%. As you can see, the range they get for their combined error rate matches well with the reported irreproducibility rates from the earlier studies, confirming the pervasiveness of irreproducibility in preclinical research using a very different approach. The percentages given for each category in their final figure, shown here, show how much each category contributed to the overall rate of non-reproducibility. At this point, they turn to the question of how much this level of irreproducibility actually affects us in terms of lost dollars. To answer this, they said, okay, let's assume conservatively around 50% of preclinical research is actually not reproducible. Using 2012 data, an estimated $56.4 billion was spent on preclinical research in the US alone. That would mean that $28.2 billion per year would actually be funding non-reproducible research. That being said, not every dollar spent on non-reproducible research is a complete waste, since the results could still have led to helpful and productive discoveries, but it certainly suggests that the reproducibility problem is economically significant, as the authors put it. With that, I'm going to leave you with this screenshot from the paper to see how the authors propose combating the most prevalent sources of reproducibility errors. In fact, many of these suggestions have already been adopted in regions around the world, depending on the institutions or countries where the research is being performed or who's publishing it. There are also a number of other ongoing efforts to make scientific results more reproducible, like making data available in online repositories, pre-registering experiment and analysis plans, giving credit or funding for replication studies, or creating opportunities to share and discuss replication results through websites like nrefigure.org, where replication experiments can be submitted and collated alongside the original data. So progress is underway. Let's see what the meta-reviews of 2020 and 25 have to say about reproducibility in science then. Until next time, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed taking a deeper look at some of the data behind this highly discussed topic. If you want to see more videos like this one, I encourage you to like and subscribe. Special thanks to Gariji Goyle, who gave me the idea for this video and actively worked with me to analyze the paper. She's an active research scientist, a teacher, and co-founder of ReFigure, something you should definitely check out if you're interested in the reproducibility of scientific results. Thanks again, Dan CBJ.